Keep up the uh, spirit, spirit of fellowship. <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs> it's all kind of falling apart. Today we're going to talk about doors. Okay, doors. And uh, I, I want to talk about doors all the way through the Bible. All the way through the Bible. One of the reasons I actually uh, love the Bible is that, and I'm going to shut this door, okay? Because you never know what they'll say out there. And I have a hard enough time keeping people without, you know, other people competing. Anyway, so <clears throat> all throughout the Bible, God has talked about, used, and given us doors. And I love the Bible because the Bible is so consistent with itself. Me, I say something one day and then somebody will say, well, you said this other thing the other day. And I'm like, well, did I? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Huh? You ever have trouble with yourself? Hello. So anyway, you know, the fact is that the Bible's not like that. It's very, very consistent. God will say something in Genesis. He keeps it all the way through. All the way through. Very, very consistent. Not only that, but the things that God talks about throughout are important for you and I to see and notice. And so doors are in the Bible from start to finish. And so I want to take a moment to talk about doors today and go to those passages and show you some of those. I can't show you all the passages because we'd be here until next Monday because there's a bunch. But I just want you to see some of the major ones. Now here... You see a door on your left that is actually the door to the ark in Kentucky. How many of you have actually been there? Okay. I'd encourage you, if you have a few out, a few days and a little bit of money, uh, slide on over there and see a life-size representation of the best that we could actually uh, put forth to illustrate the ark. And so this is a door in the ark. Uh, I've been there with my family. I've been there with many of our folks. And I've uh, been there with some friends. And uh, people always stand in front of that door. But the door that is actually on your right is a three-panel door, or I would like to say actually a two-panel door. But uh, when I bought my house that I live in now, uh, Vicki Jackson, who helped me find that house, she actually told me about that door. I didn't know about that door. So if you look at that door, it is a cross on top and an open Bible on the bottom. You see it? A cross on top, an open Bible on the bottom. And so uh, if you have that door, you can use that door to uh, share with family and friends and neighbors and guests that come over your house. You can let them know. Jesus died on the cross, and the Word of God is living and breathing and can change your life. And so, you know, that door can actually become a witness and is a witness once you actually know what the door is actually about. But that's kind of what we're going to do here. We're going to talk about the doors of the Bible, and it's going to help you to understand some things that you might not have thought about before. The first door I want you to understand is the door that comes up in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. It says, if you do well... Will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching where? At the door. So, you know, sin can come and crouch at the door. Now, remember, sin can't open the door. You have to open that door. You come to my house, I have a peephole in my door. And if Pam doesn't have it covered up with pretty things, which, you know, I'm like, no, wait a minute, this is reducing my security. You come to my door, you knock on it, I'm going to look at that peephole and see who you are. If I don't see anybody, I'm going to go over to the window and I'm going to look all the way down my front porch and see if I can see you. If I don't see anybody then, I'm going to go get some help, and I'm going to see who's at the door, you see. But I'm not opening the door. 
if you're out wandering in my backyard, I'm not opening the door. The bottom line is, is that sin is crouched at the door. Temptation comes to everybody. That is not our fault. But if you answer the door, that's not a good thing for you and I. So one of the doors that I want you to see today is the door of temptation. You don't have to answer it. It's good to look. <laughs> it's good to know what you're opening up. If you do open the door to sin, remember, you can shut it and tell it to leave. You don't have to let it stay. So that's one door. The second door I want to talk about is the one we kind of started with a little bit, and that is the door to the ark. The door to the ark. So on your left is the actual ark in Kentucky. That's what it actually looks like. It's huge and to its actual size, and you'll find out, yes, the animals can all fit in there. But know this, God gave Noah the directions and the dimensions for the ark in specific detail. Noah built it according to God's actual design. God only put one door in the ark. One door. And in this particular verse of chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 16, make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit. So here's what a cubit is. A cubit is from the end of my fingers to the end of my elbow. And yours too. Now, we know that what? My fingers to my elbow is different than your fingers to your elbow, so it's basically 17 to 21 inches, somewhere in there. And so they would make it according to cubit. And if you go to Kentucky, you will see all the cubits represented. And set the door, not doors, door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. Now, God made this door so that we could enter in and that we could actually be saved and that we could skip the judgment. Anyone can enter the door. Anyone could come in. Nobody but no one his family did and the animals that God called to the ark. The animals that God called to the ark. You and I can enter that door. Anybody could have entered that door. Noah preached for 400 years. Nobody entered. So I remember that sometimes, you know, when ministry gets hard. 400 years? You want to work 400 years and never have anything? So, but he was not working for results. He was working for God. And that's the way you and I ought to be. We should work for God. Now, this door is unusual because no one inside can shut it. Only God can shut that door. And once that door's shut, it never opens. It stays shut until salvation is complete. So when people change their minds and did not come at the invitation of God to enter through the door. Once God shut the door, there's no one that can enter in. And so they actually died in their sin. And so it's important for you and I to understand that, <clears throat> folks. You have the opportunity to go through the door of salvation. But once Jesus comes or you die, then the door is shut. And there is no reversing that door. And God is the only one who can shut it. Now, the other part of that is, is that you and I are not judges. We don't shut the door. Amen? So be very careful about being judgmental or judging somebody's salvation or judging somebody's life per se. You have to be very, very careful about that. But the fact is, is that God's the one that shuts the door. But when he shuts it, it's shut. 
and there's no reopening. Another door is the Passover door. The Passover door is the door that the children of Israel in the time of their slavery in Egypt were commanded to actually put blood of an unblemished firstborn male, lamb, on the sides and over the lintel of their door. There were other things I'm not going to go into right now, but that was actually to keep the death judgment that God was putting, the plague that God was putting on the land away from those who put their trust and faith in God. So you could say that that sort of represent a cross, if you would, as two side points and one top point leading down to the bottom. So you could say that that was a cross. But the bottom line is, it is a door that is covered by the blood of an unblemished sacrifice, firstborn male lamb. And as death came, it passed over all who were in there. That's called the Passover. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, now celebrate the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the, the communion. That is actually the Passover, as in now we actually celebrate the actual Lamb of God whose body and blood gives us salvation and eternal life. Even though we die, yet shall we? Mm -hmm. We will be passed over. We will be passed over. Then there's the door of the tabernacle. The door of the tabernacle. Now you could say that there are three doors. One door to get into the outer court. In behind the veil. In to the actual presence and relationship with God, worship of God. And there's only one, all right? One over on this side, one on the back side, one over on, you know, there's nothing underneath or above. It's all just right straight ahead. And then there's the door to the actual sanctuary, which is into the holy place. And then there's a door to the holy of holies. And so those doors, each one of them requires sacrifice and blood to actually pass through. Sacrifice and blood to actually pass through. And you have to have a priest to take you to that place. Now, for you and I, that door becomes Jesus Christ. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is the priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He is the high priest whose sacrifice done once and is never to be done again because it's complete. And so that is also a door of the Bible. And then we have the doorpost of the Shema. Of the Shema. The Shema is Hebrew word for hear, and it represents the number one commandment in the Bible. Number one commandment. How do I know it's the number one commandment? Because Jesus said it was. They asked him, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? He said, Love the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. That's 99.9% .9 of the Bible. 0.01% is the latter part. Love your neighbor as yourself. So they are to take that and put it on the mantle of the door leaning in to the house. If you come to my house... I have a mezuzah that contains the Shema on the doorpost of my house, and it leans in. And I personally kiss it and touch it. I encourage others to do it, you know, but you've got to have a little faith in that regard because, you know, you're so freaked out about germs. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, you don't have to kiss it. You can touch it. You can rub it. You know, you can whatever you want to do. But I teach, I teach anybody that comes to my house, there's the Shema. Now, for myself, I carry the Shema in the mezuzah around my neck. That's not how the actual Bible commanded it, but that's allowed, okay? You're allowed to actually have it. But the main thing is to what? Keep it. By the way, do you know why I'm wearing one of these? Has anybody been wondering why I'm wearing this? Raise your hand if you've been wondering. Yeah. Did you get a new job? <laughs> a 
Well, they gave this to me, and I said, well, I'm doctor of souls, so I'm going to actually, I'm starting a new department out in Mosaic called Soul Department, and I'm going to do renovations and renewals out there. Amen? Amen. Of the soul. Of the soul. Anyway, that was a side. So, Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. When you go in and when you come out, That's the doorpost of the Shema. And then there's the door that is narrow. The narrow door. Why is it narrow? Only those who are keto can go through it? (laughs) No. It's narrow because there's very few that go there. Let me give you some advice. Don't follow the crowd. Don't be looking for a crowd. You're not going to find a crowd. (laughs) Thousands watching Jesus die, and only three that were there that cared. The soldiers got converted, but that took some time. There was no crowd. The Bible tells us very clearly, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The door of the many is what? Why? Because there's a bunch that go there. So please understand that you will always be in a small group. Stop looking for majority approval. When I was a kid, I used to sneak into Mile High. And I used to be skinnier. <laughs> and they had this one gate that had a little little spot about this big. And I could get in there and go into Mile High. Now, oddly enough, I didn't watch the Broncos play. I kept trying to find somebody with cotton candy. And I tried to get free cotton candy. I, I was, you know, I was just a little beggar, man. I mean, I'd just walk around. You, you have any kind of some cotton candy, <laughs> you know? But the bottom line is, I could do it because it was, I was skinny, but it was narrow. And my friends, I want you to know that God's door is narrow. So don't expect it to be easy. Don't expect it to be easy. And don't expect a whole lot of people to go with you. And then there's the door that the shepherd comes through. The door that the shepherd comes through. Um, Jesus told his disciples, I am the true shepherd. Okay, now there's only one. So don't be going for this multi stuff. It's not true. There's only one. One name, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay? But Jesus said, I come through the door, and the sheep know my voice. I come to my sheep, and I come through the door. Now, this really illustrates for you and I something that, you know, when you think about it. So, for instance, if you come walking up to your house, and somebody's on the side with their body hanging half in and their butt hanging half out, how many of you are like, oh, we got company? Huh? Yeah, you're not like, oh, let's get some pretzels and put them out. I mean, no, nobody thinks like that, okay? Uh, I went to go see my son Seth. We were going to go do something real early, and I got there at dark, and I banged on the doors, and nobody's, you know, awake, and nobody's coming, no lights on, and the doors are all locked, and so I was like, well, I, man, we're going to miss the opportunity, so uh, I went and found a window that was open, and I lift that thing up, and I climbed in, crawled through. And I got in, and I got about five feet, and I met my son with some help. (laughs) He had a little helper in his hand. And he goes, Dad, don't do that. I said, well, you weren't awake. (laughs) He said, you could have gotten shot. I said, well, I've been a promotion. I'm not that. I hate hate for you to be the guy. You know what I'm saying? But the bottom line is, is that nobody thinks, oh, we got company. They're coming through the window. Nobody comes over the wall. People 
that you love and know and want come through what? The door. And so Jesus says, I'm the true shepherd. I do not come in in a false way like the false shepherds. And then there's the door of the pearly gates. Pearly gates. You've heard that phrase, pearly gates. Now I want you to understand this because this is kind of like dinosaurs eat meat. You want to know what I'm talking about when I say about dinosaurs that eat meat? Okay, I'm going to tell you. They don't know what they ate. Uh -huh. Dinosaurs don't come with like a note, I ate mate. They don't come with food in their mouth or food in their stomachs. They actually, that's all artistry, okay? They could have been vegetarians. They could have eaten vegetables and meat, but they were not necessarily as we know them. Now, here's why I say that, okay? Many of you think of the pearly gates as shut, okay? Most of us think the pearly gates are like this. I walk up to the pearly gates, they're closed. I can't get in. Okay, what else is there? Who? St. Peter, right. And I got to tell him a joke to get in. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's exactly. Okay. You know, St. Peter's, you know. I mean, how many times have you heard this joke? You know, it's like I walked into a bar. So, you, the, but the fact is the pearly gates, there's 12 of them. And the truth is that they're never closed. And they're always open. There ain't no St. Peter standing there. Here's the deal, what it says in Scripture. Revelation 21, verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Verse 25, I'm not skipping, you know, just to make it say what I want. I'm just trying to save time. And its gates will never be shut by day or night. Verse 27, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see? Those gates are open for us if our name is in the book, and they are always open. <coughs> always open. And now we come to the one that is most known of all. We come to Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door, I will come in with them and eat with them and be with them and they with me. Now notice... Where's the handle? It's on your side. Jesus doesn't have a handle. He made the door. He made the knock. But you are the opener. Okay, now let's go back to Genesis, the very door we started with. Sin is crouched at the door. Waiting for what? For us to open it. So sin has no dominion over us unless we open the door. If we open the door, Jesus will come in and be with us, be in us. I want to ask you to think about this for a minute. When did you open the door to Jesus? I want to take a moment, and I'm going to ask you, if you would like to, to out loud state the age you were when you opened that door. Keep going if you want to. Thirteen. Eight years old. Anybody else? Seven. Now, just so you know, 
if you say it or you don't say it, that doesn't mean you didn't or didn't, okay? This is not about, you know, oh, if you don't say it, you're a bad person. But I just want to give you a chance. Anybody else? 20. Now, here's the thing. You got to open this door. There's only one. And Jesus is knocking. And he wants in. And if you let him in, everything good is going to come to you. Not easy necessarily, but everything good. I would like to encourage you to open that door. Jesus is the only one that can do that for us. He's the only name given among people that a person can be saved. He is the only Messiah. He's the only way to salvation. He is the only way to the Father. Every one of us must be born again by opening that door. If you've never opened that door, I would like to encourage you today to open that door before you have to confront the book of life and the pearly gates. I encourage you today. Now, in the first couple of services, I had a few people that actually said, let's, just illustrating, I opened it at 10, shut it at 13, opened it back up at 22. How many of you got that experience? Not that age, but that experience. And so I just want to encourage you, okay? Look, if you shut the door, you can open it because it's by grace we are saved, not by works. And his grace, his forgiveness renews every single day. Isn't that great? That's beautiful. You ever seen the show, the movie uh, Groundhog Day? Well, it ain't like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you wake up every day and it's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day. And so I want to encourage you to think about it today. And as we go forward on this, I want us, if you've never opened that door, I'd encourage you to receive Jesus Christ, to turn from your sin, to be baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ, and to follow him in salvation and lordship. And so if you've never done that, please talk to us about it. Please decide today that you need to open the door. Now remember this. To anyone who seeks, they will. To anyone who asks, they will. To anyone who knocks, it'll be opened. Okay? So all you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask. And he'll come in. Let's stand together. Would you say this with me? Jesus, you died upon a cross and rose again to save the lost. Forgive me now of all my sin. Come be my Savior, Lord, and friend. Change my life and make it new and help me, Lord, to live for you. Let it be true as we sing this song together.